my campaign, first campaign for Congress, I was outspent about two to one, about five and a half, six million dollars to two million dollars, although nobody can tell, which I'll get to in a minute, because outside interest groups uh, get involved in competitive campaigns for Congress and at the state uh, level as well. Second thing I would tell you is that most Americans, and I understand and empathize with their view, probably 90% of Americans would say, would say, if asked, do you think there's too much money that influences politics in elections and in, through the uh, policy making process? Almost uh, 9 out of 10 Americans, if not more, would say absolutely, absolutely. In an ideal world, I think most of us who come from a political science background would like to have Lincoln-Douglas style debates determine everything from the outcome of the presidential race to who's the local dog catcher. Now, how many Americans do you think would be willing to follow a Lincoln-style debate around for a U.S. Senate seat? Mel Martinez just got uh, through a very uh, close uh, race, uh, where you sat and listened sometimes for four or five hours to the two candidates in a unregulated format sort of go back and forth. The truth of the matter is, even if you could put together that ideal system, most of the public is too busy uh, uh, rearing their kids, uh, uh, attending a church or synagogue, uh, working, and otherwise uh, tending to normal human American events. So the reality is that you're never going to get the ideal system uh, of uh, Lincoln-style type discussions about a broad array of, uh, of issues. I'll tell you that um, uh, uh, McCain-Feingold is the most important recent campaign finance reform at the federal level. I opposed it at the time. I would oppose it today. Trying to keep money out of politics is like squashing jello. In the first place, I will tell you that I don't think you should regulate Americans' contributions to candidates. Even if you disagree with me there, I will tell you that you cannot, as a practical matter, ever eliminate uh, unfettered funding of campaigns. Now, the first reason that I don't think that you should eliminate um, uh, significant contributions or basically unlimited contributions from legitimate American citizens or American actors is that I believe the First Amendment free speech clause was primarily directed at free speech in the political realm. There's the old joke about the Russian who in the, uh, you know, 20 years ago during the Soviet Union days, he's talking to an American who's visiting and the American says that he prefers the American system. And the Russian says, what's so good about the American system? And the, Rus and the American says, well, uh, we've got a, a, a superior system because I could stand right here, if this were America, in the uh, square near the Kremlin, and I could say that the American president's a bum. And the Soviet uh, citizen says, well, I can stand right here and say that the American president is a bum. <laughs> Free speech means first and foremost, while you know, lap dancing, all sorts of uh, commercial speech uh, and other things have been protected, the right of Nazis to march through Skokie, Illinois has been protected by US Supreme Court decisions, but free speech most importantly means the right to speak about your government, about what you like, what you don't like, which candidates that you like and don't like. And free speech means unfettered speech. Even if you disagree that we shouldn't limit the amount of contributions individuals uh, are able to uh, put into the political process, the truth of the matter is you simply cannot. The United States Supreme Court has said, for one thing, that a candidate running for office can spend as much money as he or she has because they have a First Amendment guaranteed right to do so. So that, for example, when Senator Corzine ran in New Jersey, he spent some $24 million of his money, he was ultimately successfully elected to the Senate. Not every campaign that's self-funded is successful. My opponent in the 2000 race was able to spend $5 million of his own money for a mere congressional seat and, uh, and, and ultimately did not end up winning that seat. But the bottom line is you can't stop somebody when they run themselves from spending as much as they want. The second thing you need to know is the U.S. Supreme Court has said that political action committees uh, who represent a specific special interest cannot be limited. So that while McCain-Feingold says that I can't raise more than $2,000 from any individual supporter, George Soros, who you just heard from Mel Martinez if you were here, was able to put in some 25 to $27 million that we know of. Uh, the, the Republicans, uh, 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 Texan, uh, Ms. Bob Perry from uh, Texas supported the Swift Boat uh, veterans as they attacked John Kerry and he spent uh, upwards of $5 million to do that. The bottom line is that is constitution constitutionally protected speech and you cannot limit. What you do when you drive the parties out of the process 
and cap the amount of money that I can raise and spend. If, if, I, if I do a mail piece after I've raised my money from individuals and I say that my opponent is a bum, a child molester, he's a no good this and no good that, you know when you get the mail piece because I'm required to put a disclosure on it that it comes from the Tom Feeney campaign or the Republican Party of Florida and you can take it with a grain of salt because you know the source who is making the allegations or the claims, good or bad, negative or positive. The problem we have today is with these 527s. So what they effectively do is to create an organization name that sounds great, you know, Save the Children of the World Foundation. They collect $25 million from Mr. Soros, and then they go about uh, participating in an often very unaccountable and often unproductive way in the political process. In the state level, what we did a few years ago, I think it was a big mistake, was we said that in state legislative races, the Republican Party of Florida and the Democratic Party of Florida couldn't contribute more than $50,000 to any specific candidate. What used to happen is big businesses and unions and trial lawyers and other interest groups used to give their money to the Republican Party of Florida. They'd run ads against my friend Alan Boyd saying that he was a traitor and this and that. And you would be able as a voter to know because the Republican Party of Florida would have to put on their disclosure that it was them making these allegations about Alan Boyd. You could take it with a grain of salt. That doesn't happen nowadays. What happens nowadays is the people to save the children of the world say all these bad things about Alan Boyd and then at the end of the election cycle they just throw out a $300 corporate kit and they start anew. For 300 bucks you can form a new corporation with a new name so that you will never know who is behind all these attacks and all these allegations. McCain-Feingold was sold in Congress as a way to do two things. Stop the amount of money in the process, which remember 90% of Americans would like to see happen, and number two, decrease the negativity the negativity in the process. It did need nothing of the sort. We actually doubled the amount of money roughly from the 2000 presidential race to the 2004 presidential race. It was one of the ugliest and most negative in American history and it started earlier. The negative attack ads on both sides started about eight or nine months before the election itself. Again, this is like squashing jello. It simply cannot be um, uh, effectively done on the campaign uh, finance reform side. Now, who's in favor of campaign finance reform at the largest level? The biggest people that benefit, in my view, are editorial boards. You know, the Philadelphia Inquirer, for example, in the last presidential race did not one, but 21 editorials every single day for 21 days before the election uh, pr promoting their candidate, which was, uh, which was the Democratic candidate for president. Editorial boards are able, imagine what the value is in, in some elections of the editorial board's endorsement, especially if a lot of voters, there's enormous value there, but it's, not can, it's never regulated and it can never be regulated. Why? Because the First Amendment guarantees the freedom of the press. Let me tell you if you're able, if you think, to somehow cap the amount of influence that monies or parties spend, let me tell you ultimately what any single party or individual could do, buy a newspaper you will never ever be regulated under the First Amendment. By the way, this happened in, for example, the British parliamentar parliamentary system where you have conservative papers aligned with the Tory or the Conservative Party. You've got liberal papers aligned with the Liberal Party. Every single day they support uh, their uh, team's uh, views and philosophy. The Labor Party has the uh, newspapers affiliated with it. The bottom line is if George Soros wants to start a newspaper the size of USA Today and every single day editorialize uh, on behalf of his candidates, you cannot stop it under the First Amendment. And so what am I in favor of? I'm in favor of recognizing reality, recognizing the First Amendment. Uh, when we adopted our Constitution, we had unlimited amounts of money given to the people that were promoting the, under the Federalist Papers and other arguments adoption of the Constitution. The anti-Federalists raised money. Uh, they spread uh, uh, you know, their ideas about why the Constitution should not be adopted. That's the way America got its start. That's the genesis of the First Amendment. And as a practical matter, I don't think you can change it. Now you say, well, what about the, uh, the influence of nefarious organizations? I'll tell you this, if my opponent wants to take $10,000 or $100,000 from the North American Man-Boy Love Association, which is funded by Michael Jackson, say, I think he's got the right to do it. If they're not doing anything illegal, if they are an American citizen, as long as they're advocating on behalf of their candidate, here's what I want. I want every single American to know before voting day where I get my financing and where my opponent gets his, gets his or her financing. So I would stop campaign contributions about five days or so before the election. I'd require internet reporting and I would insist that uh, every single American voter have access to determine uh, where uh, the money is coming from. 
And finally, uh, I know most of us are going to answer because it's the politically correct thing to do on our survey. Uh, is there too much? Uh, after attending the panels, I heard I believe that elections are too heavily influenced by money. I think you ought to go ahead and say absolutely yes. But I also think you ought to be realistic and say you're never, ever going to change it unless you do away with the First Amendment. And I'll leave you with this thought. Uh, in the last election cycle, we estimate a total of $8 billion was spent advocating for the candidates of one or the other of the parties at all levels, federal, state, and local. In that same cycle, $406 billion was spent for restaurants, fast foods, and bars. $54 billion for jewelry and watches, $51 billion for shoes, $10 billion for movie tickets, $19 billion for flowers, seeds, and potted plants. As uh, Justice Scalia, who also believes in unfettered contributions as long as your report said, if our democracy is drowning from this much campaign spending, it simply cannot swim. I happen to believe that A, you shouldn't regulate it, B, even if you want to, you can't. So recognize reality, require reporting, and as Jerry Maguire says, show me the money. Uh, I'm also indeed honored to be here with uh, my friends Tom Feeney and Jim Davis, uh, both of whom I've served with in the, in the Florida State Legislature and now in Congress. Uh, I feel somewhat at a great uh, disadvantage. Uh, both of them are very experienced and skilled lawyers, as many of you know, and, and I'm not. Uh, I grew up on a farm and still uh, live on that farm, so when they start talking about, when Tom Feeney starts talking about all of these uh, uh, legal parts and uh, Justice Scalia and the U.S. Constitution, I'm put somewhat at a disadvantage. Uh, but uh, I have my own ideas, having served 16 years in public service, uh, about campaigns and the money, uh, the role of money in those campaigns. Now, Representative Feeney says, basically, show me the money. I think uh, that's not a bad place to start, but I think that you need to expand that and say, show me the source of the money. Uh, actually, he spoke to that uh, uh, quite uh, eloquently, but uh, I think to understand the role that, that money is playing in, in campaigns and where we've, uh, how we got to where we are, you have to go back and look at a little bit of history. Uh, we've done two major campaign finance reforms at the federal level in the last 30 years. One was in 1974. Uh, that really came out of uh, the Watergate problems uh, that, that many of you probably read about uh, in the history books. Uh, during the Richard Nixon days. Uh, pursuant to that, there was a, a campaign act called the Federal Election Campaign Act, which changed the way campaigns are financed and created political action committees, uh, which I'm sure that all of the folks here on this panel are great supporters of. I am too. Uh, Representative Feeney referred to uh, the political action committee uh, process, but that's a way for people who have a common interest to, to uh, pool their money and uh, be involved uh, in federal campaigns. That was created in 1974 by the FECA, the Federal Election Campaign Act. That act created two sources of funding. Uh, one was what we call hard money, which is uh, uh, very tightly regulated uh, and reported. Uh, it's money that went into political action committees or personal individual money uh, that went to a candidate. The other source of money was soft money, so you got, uh, which was unregulated, it could be corporate money, could, there was no limits on the amount of money that could be uh, given to the parties or to uh, individual groups. The hard money was primarily to be used for, uh, it was to be used actually in federal campaigns for almost any purpose, but as I said, there were limitations on how to raise it, how much you could raise. And, and everybody knew who was given and uh, that they were given, they were limited in how much they could give. Uh, on the soft money side, uh, the 1974 Act uh, presumed that that money would be spent for the expenses of the political parties and party building. That is to strengthen the two-party system that we have in America that honestly has made uh, America as, as great as one of the great democracies in the world, or if not the greatest democracy in the world. <laughs> so, but what's happened over the last 30 years is that uh, under that act, the, uh, the lawyers and the political operatives figured out a way to skirt the intent of the 1970 law, 1974 law, in use of the soft money. And so you begin to see soft money playing a much more important role in campaigns 
And I know uh, back in 2002, um, up until 2002, which was the last time that we ran the campaigns under the old law, uh, you would see campaigns being financed more by outside money than they were by the hard money, hard dollars that the candidate themselves raised. I know there was a there was a congressional race uh, in this area, just in the in the Orange, just north of Orange County, in 2002, in which there was probably 15 or 20 million dollars spent. The the two individual campaigns probably spent maybe 20 percent of that, and the rest was spent by outside groups, mostly soft money groups. So all of that has led to the uh, McCain fine gold uh, that you've, you've heard a little bit about here this, mo this morning. And of course the purpose was to ban the soft money and prevent the, what I would call the unethical, unintended uh, and furtive use of, of money in campaigns uh, to try to create a situation where you'd have a more transparent system. That is that the voters out there could uh, at least see who was given the money and what they stood for and what their, their background was. Uh, and we're, we're going through the, the, the court process now on McCain Fine Gold. It's, it's working its way through the courts. The FEC, the Federal Elections Commissions, has made some rulings on that. Uh, they struck down several provisions of the uh, McCain Fine Gold. Uh, there were lawsuits that followed by the sponsors. Uh, the sponsors won those lawsuits, and the FEC now is, is in the process of revisiting their rules uh, and trying to, to uh, uh, re-implement some of the provisions that were in the law. So um, uh, the 527s that uh, you've heard a little bit about obviously are uh, continue to be a problem, but you have to understand under mccain fine goal that you can still have unregulated money. You have not, uh, you have not eliminated the ability of somebody to engage in the political process is just that that within a 90-day window of the election that you have to do it with hard money. You cannot within 90 days uh, with a 527 or, or soft money, if you will, unregulated money, uh, mention a candidate's name or depict the image or likeness of a candidate uh, in, in, the mass, in the media. So uh, is it perfect? No, I think, but I think uh, in America to, to if, if we don't continue to try to make the process better, cleaner, you will continue to see a drop off in the participation of the electoral process uh, by the public. And those statistics are unchallenged. Uh, the numbers of eligible folks who vote now is much lower compared to what it was 30, 40, 50, or 60 years ago. So I'm not sure there are any rules or laws that you can write uh, that, that an operative or an attorney won't figure out a way to get around at some point in time. Uh, you saw it happen in 1974. We've seen it happen in the state of Florida with the state uh, campaign law. You'll see it happen with McCain Feingold. Uh, th there will be loopholes that will be opened up, that will be discovered uh, over a period of time, and uh, you will have unintended uses of the law. But uh, I do believe that uh, show me the money, uh, the, the better saying is show me the source of the money, make sure that you have a transparent system. Uh, Representative Feeney has cited examples of where the person who's spending the lowest amount of money won, but I can tell you the statistics speak for themselves. Generally the person with the largest, with the, with the largest war chest, the most money, uh, will win. So I'm looking forward to uh, your questions and uh, I'm grateful for the opportunity to be here today. Thank you very much. I, I agree with Tom this is hard. Uh, shoot, if we, if we stopped trying to do stuff that was hard, why would you have a United States Congress? You know, why would we have a government for the people? This is hard, but I don't think that's why we uh, shouldn't try. Uh, I think there's some fundamental principles at work here. This is not ultimately a Democrat-Republican thing. Each of you are voters. Uh, your power is your knowledge, your youth, your health. It's probably not your money, although it will be if you want it to be someday. So this is about you, because this is about the power of people in my judgment. I disagree with Tom 
but show me the money works. Just because we know that George Soros or Ken Lay put $10 million into a race doesn't mean we're getting good government. At some point, there are tipping points. I believe one of the most wonderful things about this country is on election day, we're all the same, aren't we? Right? You go to vote, I don't care if you're Tom Feeney, Alan Boyd, Jim Davis, Jeb Bush, the president, whoever you are, your vote counts the same. And I think it's important we do have some limits on money. When I got to Washington in 1996, one of the people I got to meet was, was the last living Supreme Court Justice, Justice Byron White, wonderful human being. And I went over and I talked to him and I said, Justice White, I'm here. I'm thinking about working on campaign finance reform. He told me the worst decision he ever saw the Supreme Court rule when he was on the bench, and he was on the, long, on the bench a long time, was in 1974, Buckley v. Vallejo, which many people interpret to say that money equals speech, that there should be no limits on money. Uh, what that court also said, and I'll try not to talk like a lawyer, <laughs> is that the First Amendment is almost absolute. You all know there are no absolutes, maybe in the classroom. Um, but we as a nation recognize that corruption from too much money or even the appearance of corruption is a basis to regulate the giving of money in political campaigns. And so you got the First Amendment on this hand, money is speech, you can express what you want no matter how much money you spend. On the other hand, Y'all may be studying this in class. If you let this system get out of control, it will corrode. It will corrupt. That is human nature. That is my view. Like Alan, I've spent 17 years in politics. I've seen the best. I've seen the worst. At the end of the day, you may find it hard to believe, but politicians are humans too. And so a lot of this is about understanding how people behave and setting limits and, frankly, setting a tone. Now, I think... You know, every, by the way, every politician is an expert on campaign finance reform. It's kind of like fishing. You know, we've all done it, so we all think the way we did it is the way it ought to be done. And when you win a race, everything was right, and when you lose, everything was wrong. So you, you, I'm sure you all take what we say with a grain of salt. But actually, Tom, I do have an ideal, and it's not the Douglas-Lincoln uh, debates. Uh, and the ideal is two races I have. Um, and the reason those races were ideal for me, and I think they're good ideals, is because a lot of people gave a little. Shoot, I had some college students give me $25, or some young lawyers give me $100. Uh, it was a lot of people giving a little. That's what democracy is about at its best, a lot of people getting a little. Now, as you get into office, you've been in for a while. You know, these lobbyists we work with, you know, they want to be our friends. I think one of the things we have in common is we understand the relationship between us and lobbyists. They are not our friends. These are not personal relationships. Our ultimate relationship is between you, you are, these are your employers, these are, and Tom knows that. He treats you with respect, he's very direct, you may not agree with what he said, but he, he treats you with respect. Ultimately, this is about you, it's not about these lobbyists. One of my favorite stories in Tallahassee, you know, I was in the state legislature with Alan, so I voted against this bill that this lobbyist wanted me to vote for, he came, he, and he sent me a note, he said, Jim, come out in the hall, I want to talk to you, he said, Jim, you hurt my feelings, you voted against my bill. I said, I hurt your feelings. <laughs> What are you talking about? What do you think this is, a club? This isn't about friendship. So, you know, there are folks, and I've forgotten how many lobbyists there are for each member of Congress. I'm going to guess about 10. You know, they're there. Well, let's pick on the pharmaceutical industry. They're used to that. <laughs> <laughs> you know, they're there to do a job, and they don't have to apologize for the fact that they convinced the United States Congress to put a provision in the law that says the, con the federal government cannot negotiate discounts when buying prescription drugs. You all know about this provision? You should, because you're paying for it. You're paying for it. You're taxpayers. They don't have to apologize for that. But, you know, the big dog eats in a lot of these places. And if you don't set rules of conduct, you know, there are tipping points here. Now, when I got elected to Congress, first words out of my mouth, day after I won, raised almost a million dollars for campaign finance reform. I was just a freshman, but I thought there was too much money in the system and there wasn't enough accountability. And I got to Washington, and along with Alan Boyd and Asa Hutchinson, who's now running for governor of Arkansas, who's a, a terrific was a terrific Republican member of Congress, we helped pass McCain-Feingold. McCain-Feingold is not perfect. As each of these gentlemen point out, it's a balance and a lot's up to the lawyers. 
and the administra administrative agencies, how they interpret it. And there's lots of potholes in this thing. But let me just give you the guts of the bill from my personal opinion, what I think, why I got involved, what I think it does. It regulates what we refer to as soft money. Soft money means if someday you have lots of money, and I hope you do if that's what you want, you can give whatever you want to either political party. I have to tell you from my experience, a lot of those checks are not written for good government. Okay? Some of them are. People have a lot of money and they just believe very strongly the issue could be guns, it could be abortion, it could be whatever the issue is. But a lot of those checks are not written for good government. Okay? The second was what's been referred to up here as, as issue ads. These are ads that are run by third parties that say, you know, Tom Feeney, you know, is cruel to animals. Alan Boyd is a terrible person. Jim Davis is a terrible person. My favorite story, congressional race in Montana. Names aren't important. This guy's running for Congress. Some company doesn't like his record on the environment. He's strong on the environment. So guess what the political ad says? He beat his wife. Now, I'm making this up. That was a more effective ad than saying this guy is going to be tough on polluters, I guess even in Montana. Okay? I will never forget asking questions of a very smart Washington lawyer about this issue when he said, as Tom did, you cannot regulate me and my clients. You can't even force us to put our names on our ads. It was a wonderful moment. He said, as a matter of fact, if you force us to put our names on some of these ads, we wouldn't even run these ads. I said, could you repeat that? I said, what's wrong with that? That's exactly the point. If that company had had to put their name on their ads, and I don't mean the address of some Washington lawyer or some subsidiary in Bermuda. If they had to stand behind that ad, of course they wouldn't run that ad, would you? That's what McCain-Feingold says. Accountability. Put your name on the ad. Now, the interesting thing for those of you all that care about this issue is that the folks for good government who thought the Congress need to regulate itself gave up on Congress. Because one of the things you need to understand is this system helps incumbents. When Alan and I went to the Democratic leadership and said we were doing campaign finance reform, we weren't asking permission, we were asking forgiveness. <laughs> and, and, Tom would, Tom, and Tom, the Republicans we were working with, had the same issue. We said, hey, look, we're just misguided freshmen. We don't exactly know what we're doing, but we're going to do it. And we met this guy named John McCain, and we like what he's for. And it was a revolt, y'all. It was a revolt on the floor of the House of Representatives. I think perhaps the only time Alan and I have seen this in nine years where the body actually revolted over the Speaker of the House. Because you all know these legislative bodies tend to be dictatorships. It is very hard to beat the President of the Senate of Speaker of the House and and, and, and about, I don't know, 20 or 30 reform-minded Republicans and Democrats who tend to be more willing to regulate when they think it's in the interest of the public, um, banded together, and this bill actually passed. And it shocked people like Common Cause and the League of Voters and other folks who thought the Congress could never do something to give up some power for the incumbents to give up some power. What Alan and I knew, and Asa Hutchinson knew, was it was entirely unclear who would benefit under this, Democrats or Republicans. We just believe we knew who was losing under this. It was regular people. And the people that were gaming the system and the people on both sides, both political parties, that knew the system and knew the loopholes were going to game it. And they did. Now, what's happened since McCain-Feingold? Well, we could spend all day this on this. And I'm sure Audrey has is, is studied the election in this regard. I haven't. Um, but obviously, there's no more soft money. These unlimited checks that are given to the national parties. It can still be given to the state parties. Uh, you do have to put your name on the ads. I think it's not being done the way I would want it to be done. I think you can still sort of put the Bermuda Corporation address and some person who's not going to answer the phone, that type of thing. And Tom's right, these 527s. By the way, have any of y'all ever heard of the 527 before we set this on the panel? A few of you had. You know what the Swift Boat ads are, don't you? Weren't those devastating ads? They were devastating. They were very effective. Those were 527 ads. And I think, in fairness to the folks that ran those, you kind of knew who was behind it. I still don't know who put the money into the thing. I just know they, they weren't just against John Kerry. I think they really, really were against John Kerry. And there were ads like that against the president. So now you've got this 527 thing. 
<clears throat> and because it's not money to the candidates, it's more difficult to regulate. Now, let me close with a couple points that we're probably not going to get into depth, but I just want you to know there are other problems with the system, and I've got to be honest with you, I don't know how to fix them. But I just want to give you the benefit of my judgment as somebody on the inside about how the process is affecting you on the outside. The first is, when you get into a contested congressional race right now, and Alan just had one, one of the few in the country, you spend a lot of time raising money. And it becomes very difficult to do your job and spend the time raising money. When I'm campaigning, my favorite thing to do is to talk to folks. I'll ask them for their vote. I'll ask them for money. But there's an exchange. Well, what's important to you? How do you feel about student loans? What kind of jobs do you want to see in this state? How do you feel about Iraq? Want to go into Iran? How do you feel about the draft? When you're campaigning, you're having those conversations, that's empowering me. It's empowering you. If you're spending all your time on the phone raising money from people, not necessarily the thing, in my judgment, that's building democracy. The other thing, and this is just my opinion, I think members of Congress tend to have a skewed view of the world for many reasons. One of, the, one of us, we, we, you know, we work in Washington, D.C. That's a pretty unusual place. But the other reason is, Members of Congress have to spend too much time around people with lots of money. And pretty soon you start thinking lots of people have lots of money. I think one of the reasons many of my colleagues in Congress think the other estate tax ought to be abolished is because they, they spend so much time around people that pay the estate tax, they thought, gosh, this was affecting the whole country. Guess what? It only affects about 5% of the people in the country or 10%. But you just develop this view of reality. So I'm being critical of everybody, including myself, but I think that's a problem. Last thing I'll talk about is where we go from here and it's the internet. As you all know, the internet is a wonderful thing. Yeah, for us, it's inexpensive, and it's ubiquitous, and it's about networking. And isn't that what politics is about? It's about networking. So I think the internet is an important part of where we're going, and I actually think it's an important part of the solution. And I'm kind of like Tom on the internet. I don't like to regulate the internet. I really don't for lots of reasons. But I think a lot of us are going to hire folks like you to help use the internet to help us redevelop democracy. I don't know if we can get back to the Lincoln-Douglas debates, but I think most people today don't get their news in the newspaper. I, I disagree with Tom about the power of the editorial boards. Statistically, 80% of the American public today gets their news through the television. They don't read the newspaper, and they certainly don't read the editorial page. And the internet's becoming a big part of this. So I think how we use the internet, how you use the internet, which ultimately I think is going to be a positive thing, is going to reaffirm the principles of democracy on which this country is founded, and it's going to help us connect to each other in a more effective way. I wanted to follow up with a question that the reporter from the UCF paper asked, which was about Buddy Dwyer. And uh, my question is, lawmakers, has the law been made a little bit too fuzzy? Because on behalf of people here who raised their hand who might be considering running, I think that he might have run on good faith and that maybe the law that was written it was such a way that it's a, it is a matter of interpretation. And from my personal experience, I'm teaching a course at which I'm a TA. Somebody else wrote the syllabus. They're good students who are trying to do their darndest to get it right. And they don't know what the rules are, and they're, I don't know exactly how to ding them. So I'm thinking maybe the law is at fault rather than any of the particular players and wondered if you had any views on that you would like to share. There's an old saying in the law that uh, a, a good prosecutor in front of a grand jury could indict a ham sandwich. And uh, M uh, Mayor Dyer has been accused of things, but he has not been convicted. We all be, all, all ought to be mindful of that. In fairness to Governor Bush, he has had a standard where if you are indicted, you are removed from office. This was not a judgment by the governor on Mayor Dyer's situation. It's what he has done across the board, regardless of you know who it is. That, that uh. Secondly, I think you're exactly right. One thing you want in all laws, and this is particularly true in the campaign area, is you want some very hard black and white lines. You don't want gray areas where people are tempted to fudge. And yeah, our tax code is a gray area. You know, for example, it's one of the horrible things about our tax code. You ask 50 different accountants, which Money Magazine does, to figure out what a family of four owes in their taxes, and you get 50 different answers. One of the things that leads to fraud on Wall Street and elsewhere is the fact that this is an art and not a science. I think this ought to be a science. The third thing was I originally assumed, like I think a lot of people did, that Buddy uh, Dyer was being accused of paying specifically for individual absentee ballots. In Miami, we had a mayor thrown out of office uh, some time ago because he was paying people for 
to come in and deliver mass numbers of absentee ballots. The allegations which were substantiated were that uh, dead people vote, forgeries occurred, et cetera. My understanding is that Mayor Dyer has not been accused of having dead people vote knowingly or forgeries. And if that's true, then I may have a real problem with what has happened to the mayor. And I'm a Republican. Uh, I can tell you that in my days with uh, Buddy Dyer, while I disagree with him uh, often as I do with uh, Alan and Jim, I never saw him do anything uneth unethical or irresponsible. And so we're watching this very uh, carefully, but you're right. We ought to have a clear black line, what's acceptable, what's not acceptable. And I don't think the law was intended to get at what the mayor may have been accused of. Having said that, I did not read the indictment. There may be more to it than what I've read. And I'm not going to comment on the specifics of the case because it wouldn't be appropriate because I don't know them. But I do want to add one point. Whether it's Buddy Dyer or you, Professor, or anybody in this room, if you are charged with a crime, the Constitution, and I'm not a criminal lawyer, but the Constitution says that the law has to be clear as a matter of fairness to you. Because if, you not, if you're not clear on the law is, and you've done something wrong, or you've done something that a prosecutor says is wrong, did you really know? Did you, you know, what's the stop sign there? Warning, this is the rule. Don't cross this line or don't cross it then. So I, I think from afar, this is going to be an issue in this case, and it's an issue in cases like this anytime somebody is charged with a crime. It is ultimately incumbent upon your elected officials, whether that's us or legislators, to try to write very clear laws on how you conduct a recount in a close election or how you deal with situations like this. It, it, ultimately, these decisions, if they're, done if they're done well, are done well at the very beginning as opposed to judges and juries and lawyers have to argue over what the legislature intended or what's right or wrong. I, I also personally know and served with Buddy Dyer and know him to be a person of the highest integrity. I don't have any uh, particular specific knowledge uh, of the case, but uh, we are dealing with